Hey, it's Soul with another video brought to you by Team Friendship. Want to be a part of the club? Check the Patreon link below. The battle for Azeroth rages on, and there's no telling who will come out the victor and who will live to see its aftermath. Today's video will mirror the previous piece on a potential new warchief, and will this time focus on the Alliance. The Alliance doesn't have an official office like the Warchief, but he or she who sits on the throne of Stormwind is often referred to as the leader of the pack. Get it? You know, Varian, Wolf, a uh, pack? Okay. But in a time of great crisis, who would rise up to the occasion? Or who will be risen for the greater interest? We're going to quickly go through a list of candidates with a brief summary and the following metrics. The will or the drive to become a leader of the Alliance their experience, either in military command or relevant combat expertise, their temperament, can they keep their cool on the battlefield or the negotiating table, their charisma or the ability to inspire belief in the cause, and their background, what armies and infrastructure do they bring to the table. Going in no particular order, we'll at least start with the current incumbent, King Anduin Rin. Anduin was raised to be king so he was taught at a very early age the nuance of politics and social maneuvering, as well as the schools of war, regardless of his interest. To him, being leader of the Alliance wasn't a matter of will, but almost certainty. His greater experiences before his crowning took place on the ground in places like Pandaria and the Broken Shore. The true test of his mettle is taking place now against Sylvanas' horde and the so-called Blood War. Most of the Alliance leaders are fairly level-headed, but Anduin is especially calm. Maybe that comes from careful inexperience. But with that youth comes some overconfidence, which led to his unpreparedness for someone like Sylvanas, who disregards niceties in the face of war. But he still commands what is arguably the largest human nation, and with it formidable resources that is probably the biggest reason this seed of humans represents the Alliance leadership. The King of the Gnomes is currently not in a great state. Like the goblins, the gnomes have brought a unique and powerful set of tools for the Alliance that helped them through many battles, especially during the conflict on the Zaralor. By contrast, it's a small wonder why Gnomeregan, his own home, took a great deal of time to finally secure. Like many of the other leaders, Geblin doesn't have the ambition to lead the Alliance so much as he wants to just survive one conflict to the next, and hopefully he gets through this current one. Matthias Shaw leads the Alliance intelligence apparatus, giving him both a breadth of experience at command and a wealth of information, some of which includes possibly leverage over his fellow counterparts. With a relatively cool head, he serves the leaders of Stormwind, which in turn means serving the interests of the Alliance. From dismantling the Defias Brotherhood, to stymieing the Alliance of the Twilight Cult, to Azeroth's defense against the Burning Legion. In a way, that means Shaw could have challenges switching from a position of gathering intelligence to receiving this intelligence and understanding the big picture. Like many in this line of work, it appears that Shaw prefers to be where he is, in a powerful position that is seldom seen. The united might of the dwarves makes them one of the most steadfast defenders of the Alliance. If not for Stormwind, Ironforge is arguably the least vulnerable seat of power from a strategic standpoint. Muradin and Falstad, even Moira individually have had their own adventures and victories. Together, they represent an imperfect unity not seen among their people for many years and is an example of what's possible under their banner. But they're already a council of sorts, sharing leadership duties amongst each other. It's not likely that together they all have aspirations to take the other kingdoms and races under their sway, especially when they continue to be challenged with their own internal disputes. Moira Thaurissen has become a standout character since the death of her husband many years ago, and on a few occasions has tried to take the seat of Ironforge. In more recent days, she's been serving on the Council of Three Hammers, representing the Dark Iron Clans before their signing into the Alliance at the start of the Blood War. There is a chance that she still has her sights set on ruling all the Dwarven Clans if given the chance, but as for the whole Alliance, that remains to be seen. Still, Moira's made a mark with her technological contributions to the war, and has demonstrated solidarity with the Alliance, at least for now. The Speaker of Azeroth may currently be acting in the interest of the World Soul, but there's no guarantee that later, if he's still around, he won't choose a side when the time is right. 
Magni's presence as King of the Dwarves was already imposing. As the so-called King of Diamonds, there's an untapped power that is yet to be seen, that is if there's anything more to being the Speaker of Azeroth than just looking sharp, you get it, you know, diamonds are… okay. If anything, his title alone should have been powerful enough to stop the Horde and Alliance conflict from starting in the first place. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Being a neutral party without significant firepower to back that up does not put him in a very persuasive position, Speaker or not. If somehow Magni were to be made leader of the Alliance, it would be in name only. It's likely that he'd be up there because someone put him there for symbolic reasons, and because he too thinks it's an effective position to be in. Sara is Anaru, a manifestation of the light or holy light depending on the religion. Sara isn't known to be a fighter, a military tactician, or a powerful mage, but it is a being that Anduin Rin takes pretty seriously. It's not likely that all of a sudden a Naru like Sara would just show up and say, hey, Anduin's gone, long live the king, but <laughs> I'm in charge now. But it's more like it would have been Anduin deciding to put his faith into the light, literally. The light isn't worshipped the same way among the diverse races of the Alliance, but has been a unifying force. If the motivations are aligned, Anaru can in fact lead the Alliance in a symbolic role, even if it were someone else running the day to day. Talia Four Dragon is the daughter of Bolvar Four Dragon, and possibly the daughter of a queen, but that's not very important in this context. She's entered Anduin's life as, so far, a supporter of the Alliance in their war against the Horde. As someone new to the scene, there's a lot for her to prove, and she's already made reasonable progress with an almost casual but still firm sense of justice. Elevating her into the small club of Alliance leadership is no small jump though. But historically, if there's any big jump to be made, it's going to be made with marriage. In the event of Anduin and Talia forming a union, followed by he being left unable to assume his duties as king, his spouse would inherit the responsibility, as well as leadership of the alliance if that were the sort of succession that she wanted. Whether she would do well would definitely depend on her advisors, as well as the training that she's received as a mere squire in Kul Tiris. And then there are the challenges that lay before her, like a certain someone far up north. The champion has seen nearly every major conflict over the past 15 years and doubtlessly affected the course of history on Azeroth and beyond. The champion has held offices from commander to leader of their order, but has had no aspirations beyond defeating the conflict that lay before them, whether it's defeating the Lich King or dealing with an overabundance of nuts and squirrels. He or she has no army, save for those who are assigned to them, but there's little doubt that if the champion made an effort to rally others to their side, they would instantly create a nation of warriors. Kalia Menethil is a symbol of the human dynasties that once dominated the Eastern Kingdoms, made more ironic by the fact that she's no longer technically alive. Under more favorable circumstances, she could have made her claim to the throne of Lordaeron. Her will to make this claim stems not from ambition, but empathy for those who she still considers her people, even if they too are now in debt. But that still leaves her with very little to offer other than her name and the burden that bears. What has yet to be explored is if the political power of a so-called exiled monarch holds any sway in the middle of a war over a people who have changed greatly. Velen is the longest lived leader among the Alliance leadership. With that comes patience and experience, but at the same time a calm that could be misunderstood as a lack of urgency given how much he's seen. His experience with others has been more spiritual than practical. He never developed the same kind of military experience like his demonic counterparts, Kil'jaeden and Archimonde. As a spiritual leader though, he is unmatched, and in many societies who rely on faith, such as the human nations, faith is extremely powerful. He's well suited to carry on the ideals of justice and unity that the Alliance uphold, but if he wants the job, he has few if any indications of interest. High Exarch Turalyon is uniquely the oldest living human known on Azeroth. Empowered by the light, he's a symbol of faith for the people. He commanded the Grand Armies of the Alliance in the Second War and ensured Azeroth's safety after fighting in Draenor, and then fought demons for a thousand years, which makes his resume all the better but also raises questions of just how human he is anymore. Long life is not typical for a human of Azeroth, and there have only been a few demonstrations of how this has affected his mind. 
He still holds a fierce grudge against the orcs, but was able to reserve himself against the sight of the living dead. Today he leads the Army of the Light, a spacefaring, fighting force of warriors from other worlds. Given his past and current reputation as an icon of the Light, it'd be easy for him to rally most anyone under his banner. A son or daughter of Lothar, Alaria Windrunner was once Ranger General of Silvermoon, which might not do her any favors these days, but it's testament to her ability to lead. She too is a veteran of a thousand years of war against the Burning Legion, but she got a little sidetracked along the way, developing abilities to control the Void. She doesn't inspire the same awe as her partner Trallian does, but she has found kindred spirits in the Void Elves, those who believe in the Alliance and the gifts that the Void offers. That in turn has made her attractive to other wayward elves looking for a cause. She's never had any outside interests other than her family and to do the right thing, so only if the task of leading the Alliance was thrust on her with no choice, she'd probably do it. Whether she commands the Alliance or not, her presence comes with a risk due to her constant internal struggle against the whispers of the Void. There's both a measure of faith and reservations to be had with her. Are her actions and decisions her own? Is there the possibility of going berserk or becoming corrupted? Gen Greyman is king of his people, if not the land of Gilneas that was ravaged by the Forsaken. He was one of the leaders of the Alliance of Lordaeron before its fracturing, due in part to how it handled the aftermath of the Second War. Greyman's will and spirit was affected by a number of tragic experiences. The death of his son, the loss of his homeland, the workification of his people. It's left him struggling internally, but expressed outwardly by his almost single-minded hatred for Sylvanas. He's at King Anduin's side and has served as a faithful advisor, but he's had a clear slant against managing a lasting peace with his adversaries, as opposed to delivering a final and violent justice. As the Blood War began, that stance has softened a bit, but he's no less motivated to securing the safety of his people and the Kaldori, who lent their hospitality until they could no longer. Taronda Whisperwind is arguably the most experienced governor among the Alliance leadership, serving her Kaldari for over 10,000 years. She's a veteran of countless battles, starting with the first invasion of the Burning Legion, and has observed the survival of a race since the Sundering. Despite her people's xenophobia until more recent times, she has a worldly experience that few can share. This also left her with a sort of hubris that left her shaken after more recent events following their re-entering the world stage including the massive loss of life at Teldrassil, considered the conflict that sparked the Blood War. Feeling abandoned by the Alliance after its forces were stretched thin across multiple regions, since then Taranda underwent a desperate and dangerous ritual to become the Night Warrior, a self-styled avatar of her goddess's wrath. What this truly means still needs to be explored, but it's clear that her current vision is limited to retaking what lands remain contested, and the interests of the Alliance as a whole are secondary. Malfurion Stormrage is considered by some to be the most powerful mortal on Azeroth. His ability to call upon nature to heal the land and drive back enemies makes him both a force on the battlefield and a symbol of inspiration to those who witness his abilities. This also puts into question his lack of presence on Silithus, where his considerable power could be of use, but that has yet to be explored. As another long-lived member of the Alliance, he's had a history of questionable leadership decisions, putting his interest in nature and the Emerald Trium first, which might not serve as great optics, given that that sort of vigil means sleeping. Malfurion was almost mortally wounded in the brief War of Thorns that preceded the Blood War, and in the aftermath, he shares Tyrande's interest in their people and vengeance first. Jaina Proudmoore may be considered as one of the most powerful living mages on Azeroth today. She's had a long career on both the front lines and the governor's office, from fighting in the Third War to ruling the port of Theramore, until its destruction by Garrosh Hellscream when she changed. The burden of history defined her life from then on, with the horrors of one tragedy to the next fueling a bitterness against the Horde that eclipsed warmer days of calling for equal justice for those who deserved it. Her lack of temper and lone wolf attitude in the middle of a demon invasion are unforgettable black marks concerning her ability to lead. But as of now, she is the Lord Admiral of Kul Tiris, with the most powerful navy on Azeroth at her command. How she uses this new power will be a critical reflection to a possible future as leader of the entire Alliance. 
Isa Cloudsinger leads a faction of Pandaren whose beliefs run parallel with the Alliance. She and the Pandaren are more like a cultural exchange program than a faction poised to lead the Alliance to a tomorrow, better or worse. She likely has no aspirations going farther than just enriching fellow citizens in mind, body, and spirit. As one of the remaining Sons of Lothar, Khadgar ranks among Azeroth's most powerful living mages. He's accomplished more than most as the one-time commander of the Alliance armies, leader of the Kirin Tor, and a go-between for the Alliance and Horde advances on the alternate Draenor. Khadgar sees the big picture, and has acted in the interests of Azeroth, even if that meant assisting members of the Horde. That's caused friction in the past, but in today's Azeroth, if the planet was in, in immediate danger, would Khadgar side with the Alliance, let alone lead them if the situation demanded it? Or could he flex his power as leader of the city-state of Dalaran and enact a truce by force? He knows that as a mage of his caliber, he's a walking weapon of mass destruction, which could easily be used as leverage on the political stage. Instead, his talent and expertise is in the long game, but that game won't last much longer if Azeroth falls into corruption or worse. Halford Wormbane is the commander of the Seventh Legion, and thus, the spear of the Alliance's activities on Zul'dazar in this current war. He has a long resume that goes back to the campaign against the Lich King in Northrend, and has led an incredible number of victories without the use of dragons, artifact weapons, or other enhancements. It's not common to be a veteran of so many encounters which makes Wormbane a reliable field commander, who's earned the inspiration and loyalty of his superiors and those he's led but he's lacking in the subtleties of diplomacy. He's better suited to defending his realm from enemies. Which leaves the possibility that the vacuum of power within the Alliance leadership could never be filled. By comparison, the Horde came together and stays together because if they didn't, many of their factions would fall into ruin or become extinct altogether. Where the original Alliance of Lordaeron came together under the threat of the Orcus Horde, the modern alliance is united under a mutual benefit of each other, but not necessarily a need. It's possible that without a unifying beacon like Stormwind to rally under, the alliance would fracture and maybe collapse. The Calderai and Gilneans may scatter while the Lightforge Draenei would rejoin their people on the Exodar, or perhaps they would just all up and leave. Meanwhile, the humans and dwarves would suffer under some solitude, but if not for the threat of war or the destruction of the planet, their kingdoms would probably live on. That about covers the many possibilities as to who would lead the Alliance. Share your thoughts, cast a vote, or leave your own suggestion like making everyone in the Alliance into Forsaken, yay! Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like the video and support the channel. I'll see you next time. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and stay breezy.